good morning, everyone. Um, and on behalf of the steering panel of our World Heritage uh, Initiative, we welcome you to this first uh, of its kind, a year long debate on matters related to world heritage. Uh, through this debate, uh, we hope uh, that uh, we will be able to enhance the conservation and management of our common global world heritage with the active involvement of the various stakeholders, communities, and professionals alike. Today, we have gathered in this uh, online 24-hour webinar session one on the theme of uh, transformational impact of information technology, uh, bridging the digital divide with participant participation of uh, right now, I think we have close to about 100 people, but more than 725 people have uh, already registered in the overall uh, webinar. So which shows us that this network is uh, growing stronger by the day, which is mainly thanks to the tireless effort of various partners, volunteers, uh, anchors, uh, my co-hosts and co-anchors, under the very able leadership of our conveners, Dr. Mario Santana and Haifa Abadalim, both of whom are present in the meeting. So we welcome them to this particular uh, session, the first session. I, along with my co-chair, uh, K. Van Dam, welcome each one of you to this webinar, which we have envisioned as a relay marathon which will, we hope in this next 24 hours, will be touching every corner of this world so that more and more people can be heard and can join us uh, with the, giving them a possibility to contribute to this initiative. And now I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Mario Santana, a professor at the University of Carleton, Ottawa, Canada, a very dear friend of more than 20 years. And I'm sure many of you would already know uh, of him or would have rather met him because he has a very long association with this region and his tireless pursuit of documenting and training the emerging professionals, especially in the use of uh, technology uh, in several world heritage uh, sites for the last 30 years. Uh, has been really exemplary, and we are very, very privileged and glad that he is among us to open the first session. Over to you, Mario. Thank you, Divai. You're, you're really, you are too kind with your introduction, as always. And uh, I equally want to thank you for all your leadership in this uh, organization of the Globinar. And I would like to welcome all the participants on behalf of the steering panel of our World Heritage. So as uh, Divai said, this is the first activity of 12 months of debates on World Heritage issues that will be held throughout 2021. Our World Heritage is a public initiative primarily aimed at developing a stronger role for civil society in World Heritage conservation efforts. Throughout this year of debate, we intend to develop a number of proposals for the enhancement of the World Heritage System in 2022 to mark the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. The 2021 debates aim to raise general awareness about critical threats that natural and cultural war heritage sites are encountering from increasing development pressures, industrial and mining operations, climate change, unsustainable tourism and conflicts, among others, and to develop opportunities for the involvement of civil society in finding sustainable solutions. Our goal is to involve a large group of professionals, NGOs, institutions, and citizens engaged in heritage protection, conservation, and management to organize a permanent network of civil society that is able to provide the public with an independent assessment of the situation of World Heritage Sites. From the beginning, the initiative has given priority to working with cultural and natural heritage places in regions of the world and across generations. So far, our, our World Heritage has held a successful virtual launch in November 2022, moderated by the dynamic international journalist, Zainab Badawi. If you have not yet seen it, I encourage you to view it on the organization's website, Our World Heritage, and we can put the website uh, further. 
Generative debate on the transformational impacts of information technology has two goals. The first is to build a robust global network of organizations, professionals, and individuals interested in the topic. The second is to discuss ideas on how to enhance the use of information technology to monitor our world heritage sites and to present multiple narratives throughout various tools of interpretation. The participation of over 700 people from around the world on these webinar shows that the network is strong, thanks to the tireless efforts of our co-conveners, myself and Haifa Abdelahim, and the many members of our team that are working with you today is a clear evidence. We invite you, each of you to get involved today in all of other activities and debates this year. And I look forward to hearing your ideas and hope that you enjoy this webinar. January's debate on transformation and impacts technology, as I said, has these two very important goals. The participants of around the world are multiple. And we hope that you really enjoy this, this webinar. And just to end, I would like to thank all our anchors, panelists, rapporteurs, moderators, and technical staff that has made this webinar a very successful from the very beginning. So back to you, Dibai. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mario. And just to add to Mario, the transformational impact of technology is uh, everywhere because of the particular situation uh, we have been uh, put in uh, in the last year. So even the most reluctant of the people have embraced technology. And I think this webinar itself is, a, I think, an example where I think the coverage, the dialogue uh, is, uh, is far greater than any uh, of the normal uh, offline seminar. Of course, I know we all miss uh, the personal touch and meeting each other personally, but I think in the new abnormal, this is the best uh, that we could do. Uh, and I will now pass on the baton to Hyson, my co-anchor, uh, to initiate the further proceedings and break the ice. Okay, thank you very much, Diva, and thank you, uh, Maria, for your you know, introduction. Well, um, prior to moving on to the next, uh, Let's do something fun and interactive as an icebreaker activity. Uh, to do so, uh, I'd like to give you some quick ground rules on how you can participate. So please access the link and it will directly uh, you to the page. You can enter uh, your uh, name and click the join button. Then you will be ready to take part. So did everybody join the first uh, poll? Okay. Okay, let's create an awesome live class by having you to tell us which UNESCO site you are associated with. Uh, we will give you just one minute to submit your answer. So once you submitted your answer, please enjoy how our clouds are being shaped. Okay, let's do that. Okay, we are going to conclude this activity in 20 seconds. Okay, now we completed our first activities. So we are going to share this amazing world art through our social media. Thank you very much for your participation. Then uh, let's move on to the second activity as icebreaker to get a quick sense of where everybody is from. So you will be given 30 seconds to provide an answer. Now we have uh, 10 seconds. OK, 
Okay, we are going to close our activity. Oh, many of the participants is a majority of them is from the ACE Plus region because we are in the session one. Okay, very good. Uh, we actually have completed two polls now. So thank you so much for your active participation. We hope that you really enjoy this ice breaking activity. So now we uh, invite you to watch our thematic video about our transformational impacts of information technology. The digital revolution is transforming the ways people know, understand, use, and visit heritage sites. How is the World Heritage Convention addressing this historical transformation? How can collective knowledge and big data become tools for heritage conservation and foster its integration into comprehensive planning systems? How can information technology support transparency in, and access to, decision-making and management processes of the Convention? How can digital technologies, including social media, promote heritage education and awareness, and provide support to the cultural and creative industries? Within the theme of transformational impacts of information technology, we aim to establish a robust network of organizations and professionals. And work together to put forth policy recommendations to the World Heritage Committee at its 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention in 2022. Striving to inspire discourse and action, we are exploring how we can use technology to monitor our World Heritage sites and to present multiple narratives through various tools of interpretation. Be part of the conversation now and help it unfold in January 2021. Join us as we look for communities across the globe to propose ways to use the technology for monitoring World Heritage Sites. Propose ways that we can interpret and present the history of a site to tell multiple narratives. Put together an interdisciplinary team of community members, site custodians, nonprofit organizations, universities, institutions, and industry partners. Submit your notice of intention by December 11, 2020. Let us know if you would like to participate in the discussion and be part of the change. We will support you along the journey as we head into January 2021. Thank you. And uh, now I'm going to move on to the announce the global competition. Uh, taking uh, this opportunity, we would like to make an announcement. Uh, our team is launching a global competition to highlight uh, transformation and use of technology that increase community engagement in monitoring, interpretation, and presentation of world heritage sites. Uh, two main purposes of these competitions are as can be seen in this slide, to strengthen the monitoring of World Heritage Sites using information technology, and to enhance multiple narratives in interpretation and presentation of World Heritage Sites using the information technology. So this competition is therefore uh, designed to uh, celebrate innovative approach to fostering engagement in heritage properties uh, with a special focus on the project grounded in the need and the visions of a local community who cares for sites. So we'd like to invite you to be a part of this competition. Uh, for this, we encourage you to submit your letters of intention by the 29th of January 2021 at 11.59 CET. Uh, uh, 23.59 CET in the PM, I, I mean the, the midnight. Uh, for more information, and please kindly visit this website. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hyson. Yeah. And now I think uh, we are uh, heading uh, to uh, the highlight of this session, which is basically the experts talk. Uh, the three experts who are going to be talking and uh, Chen, over to you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Chen Yang from Tongji University in Shanghai, China. And uh, it's a great opportunity to 
see you guys all online in Saturday morning and uh, afternoon in Shanghai. So let's start to have the plenary. Uh, so with the main theme of bridging the digital gap in our world heritage, we have invited three speakers from um, Australia, China, and Japan. And uh, in this section, the three speakers will cover the three topics, uh, monitoring, natural cultural link, and interpretation. So firstly, I want to introduce um, Professor Wei Dong from um, Southeast University of China to speak about monitoring. Yep. So Professor Wei Dong, can you please start to share your screen? So during, um, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction about, about you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yang. Yeah. And uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here join this uh, important uh, uh, global here. Uh, so uh, today I would like to make a short discussion, uh, introduce about my work uh, in Myanmar uh, okay. since the last uh, two years. Uh, we use uh, uh, some of the digital technologies for working in a heritage site called Miaowu in west of Myanmar. Uh, this is a World Heritage Tentative List. Uh, so we are working together with an international team uh, together under the framework of UNESCO uh, for the uh, domination, nomination for the uh, World Heritage uh, List. Uh, this, uh, this is our work. Uh, so uh, we are very happy to work with uh, many international experts together uh, for this uh, uh, project. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, this is a very technical uh, oriented work uh, for me and my team. Uh, we start this work uh, in Myanmar since the uh, beginning of uh, uh, 1917, uh, 2017, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this uh, is a very high challenge work for us because this is the first time uh, for Chinese team to work abroad uh, for heritage, uh, uh, heritage conservation and also for World Heritage nomination. Uh, so uh, before that, we start to understand how the organization in Asia countries, uh, here we can see, uh, the uh, a report from uh, Asian Development Bank it says uh, the during these years uh, organization in Asia is very goes to very fast and uh, uh, so it's a very important uh, uh, project for us uh, to working with uh, colleagues uh, from Asia countries. Uh, here you can see according to World Bank uh, and also. Uh, Urban report from UN uh, all mentioned in the coming 30 years, the organization in Asia is uh, the major part of the world organization. organization. Uh, there will be 2.4 billion people will go to the cities uh, from countryside within Asia countries. So this is a large number for us. So we can see uh, there are some figures uh, from uh, UN, uh, the organization in Asia countries uh, goes faster and faster in the coming 30 years. Under such kind of uh, background, we start to uh, make some research about the historic cities in whole Asia. Uh, first of all, we study about the uh, great uh, rivers and uh, the relationship of the river business and the location and development of uh, historic cities in Asia. Uh, this is a very uh, rough map for us uh, to uh, just understand the, the general structure of uh, distribution and uh, the location and the uh, relationship with uh, rivers in Asia. And uh, this is show us how the great cities is developed, developed during the past years. And also uh, we analyze the marine time, the sea road, and the uh, sea road along the 
South Asia. So many, many historic cities, they are working together in the past. They are not uh, one city work, work but a system and a network. So we can understand the so-called uh, Silk Road. It's not uh, just a, a, a single line. It's a network system in different places. So from Asia to Europe in the past, uh, there are many, many such kind of uh, urban systems linking together. So this is, uh, we understand that what means about the Silk Road and what means about the historical cities cluster. And also uh, about the culture issues uh, in the world and the issues. We can see, uh, for instance, the religion uh, in the world, uh, in, especially in Asia, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, Muslim are uh, major religions also including the Christianity. So there are many, many different uh, cultures in this region. So we, we should understand the different cultures working together. And also the economic development in Asia is goes faster and faster uh, in past, uh, since past 20 years. Uh, for instance, uh, GDP uh, growth and uh, uh, import and export uh, in Asia countries uh, goes uh, very fast. Uh, so uh, in this uh, region, we can see along with the uh, economic and social de development, but the disaster is also uh, getting more and more uh, because of the environment uh, issues uh, have a great impact to the uh, cities, especially the cities along with the coast. Uh, for, for instance, flood uh, uh, in many Asian countries, they're suffering with the flood problem, uh, especially the many of the historic sites. So in general, we hope uh, for the coming years, uh, especially for Asian countries, uh, we should have a historical city network together uh, to let people understand the values, the problems and challenges uh, in the future. We should work in together. So I'm very happy uh, I can join this uh, important uh, meeting to discuss the issue about the uh, heritage conservation with uh, uh, digital technologies. Uh, from the uh, point of viewpoint of view of, of UN, we can see uh, in the coming years the sustainable development uh, is a very important goal for whole countries. So we use uh, such kind of uh, global goals to understand the, the uh, historic cities uh, in China and in all Asian countries, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, where we, can, we, we are working with. Uh, in uh, this region, in Southeast Asia countries, they are very, uh, have a very rich heritage and a rich uh, uh, culture in the past. So our purpose is how to have a, a common understanding for every country uh, for the heritage conservation and uh, how we can work in together. This is uh, important for us. Uh, so we uh, start to research about the history of Myanmar uh, for the past and how it's, uh, uh, the country is developed and what's the relationship with uh, the, the, the neighboring countries. And it's a uh, uh, geography and the relationship with the uh, historic cities, how the cities is growing uh, in, the far, in the past and where the capital cities is located and why. Uh, for instance, 
Uh, this is uh, the city we are working with uh, in the western of Myanmar called Miao Wu. It's a ancient capital of our state. Uh, it's a uh, start from the first century and the last in the for the 18 centuries. Uh, uh, to the left that we can see uh, the geographic uh, geographic situation of the state and the location of the uh, ancient capital city here. It's uh, along with uh, uh, rivers and uh, back to the uh, important mountain. And so uh, we also have a comparative study about other capital cities in Myanmar. For instance, it's a, a group of historic cities uh, in Mandalay, in the middle of uh, Myanmar. It's a uh, different uh, uh, capital cities in the past in, in Myanmar's history. And uh, it's a relationship with uh, uh, rivers and the uh, geographic situation. So our work uh, for the site is uh, have a close uh, relationship with local people, especially local archaeologist team and historians, and also uh, international experts from different countries. And uh, uh, everything, Dong? yes. Professor Dong, you have two minutes. Yes. Okay, Two minutes. sorry. Ah. So we, uh, our team, uh, work in the site uh, for seven times in the past two years. Uh, each time we, were, we stay in the local site uh, about two weeks. Uh, we collected a lot of uh, historical information, uh, such as uh, ancient uh, maps and uh, old photos. Uh, we use a lot of uh, equipment uh, uh, working on site. We start almost from zero because there are no base map. We have to do base map by ourselves. So we use a uh, drawing and uh, uh, 3D scanners and uh, all kind of equipment uh, together to make measure uh, mapping for the areas. Now this is uh, our uh, students work. And we also we have a, a simulation analysis about flood because flood is a very, very big uh, disaster every year for the city. So this is uh, according to different uh, water levels, uh, how the flood is covering the areas. And also we make uh, historic analysis and values. And also we have uh, uh, sociologists and anthropologists working together with us. Uh, to have a local uh, investigation for population and the social economic situations. So we finally, we have a database established uh, with uh, uh, different kind of heritage information. So far, we can do, uh, with such kind of a database, we can do urban planning and heritage conservation planning uh, this is our work so far for the heritage conservation, uh, how to protect the uh, different kind of uh, heritage, uh, such as pagoda and uh, temple and uh, royal palace, and also re uh, residential areas, uh, extra. And we have a 3D modeling uh, for the whole area. Uh, this is the palace area. Uh, okay, this is a, a brief intro introduction of our work in Myanmar so far. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Professor Dong. And uh, I think it's a, it's a great share, um, not only with single sites, but also with, I like the historic urban network, um, because we are really monitoring a large scale landscape or region with the information technology. I think technology is not only helping us to modeling, to, you know, to measuring one single site, but enabling us 
to look at a large region and to monitor a large region with all the people connected. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, for our audience, if you have any questions or any comments, you can put in the um, chat box or you can go to Maribor to share your thoughts. And then we will have an interaction um, um, part after the three speakers finish their presentation. Okay, thank you, Professor Dom. So our next speaker, I hope to introduce Masahito, Professor Masahito Yoshida from Japan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name yes. is Mahito uh, uh, Yoshida uh, from University of Tsukuba. Yeah, thank you very much. The uh, World Heritage uh, Studies in University of Tsukuba it was established in 2004 to fostering young professionals studying nature and uh, natural and cultural heritage. Taking this advantage, we established the UNESCO Chair on Nature Culture Linkages in Heritage Conservation. In this program, we hosted a capacity building workshop to invite young professionals and the mid carriers from Asia and the Pacific countries. We'd like to share our experience with audiences. World Heritage Convention uh, deals both nature and culture in single convention. We had a possibility to evaluate the value of combined works of nature and man or man's interaction with his environment both in cultural and natural heritages. In 2005, World Heritage Committee decided to merge two separated uh, uh, set of criteria into a series of 10 criteria. However, uh, by practical reason, cultural criteria are evaluated by ICOMOS and the natural criteria are evaluated by IUCN, even though the site was nominated as a mixed culture and water, uh, natural heritage. When, uh, when uh, Pimatrin Aki, place of Anishinaabe people uh, in Canada, was deferred in the World Heritage Committee in 2013, separation of evaluation procedure and the lack of understanding in instruction, interaction between people and nature has been severely, severely criticized. World Heritage Committee adopted the decision to encourage World Heritage Center and the advisory bodies to improve the understanding of the interrelationship between culture and nature. In Asia and the Pacific region, there are many cultural sites which has a natural value such as Mount Fuji and many natural sites which has a cultural value such as Yakushima in Japan. Low for protection of cultural property sometimes protect the natural value on the other hand, protected area system under the Nature Conservation Administration sometimes contribute to the protection of cultural properties. Integration of cultural and natural value is fundamental requirements for the managers and the practitioners in Asia and the Pacific region. Capacity building workshop on nature culture linkages uh, in heritage conservation aims to provide knowledge, uh, awareness, and the tools to young professionals and mid careers who are involved in heritage conservation in the field. Uh, the goal was to clarify management challenges, the skills that heritage practitioners need, and to explore methodologies to identify both cultural and natural values in heritage conservation. Uh, participants from Asia and the Pacific introduced their experience through presentation in case studies. Through the field visit to the Pacific site, uh, during the workshop, participants learned how local managers and the practitioners try their best to integrate nature and culture in the heritage site. First year in 2016, we visited uh, Shirakawa Go and Gokayama and the Noto Peninsula in central Japan under uh, the theme of agricultural uh, landscape. Agricultural landscape is a typical interaction between man and nature, uh, can be observed elsewhere in the world. Under the World Heritage Convention, it is recognized as a type of cultural landscape. Historic village and uh, of uh, Shirakawa Go and Gokayama was inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1995 
recognizing its outstanding universal value of gusho style house with steep touched roof uh, that is adaptation for heavy snowfall. On the other hand, uh, Noto Peninsula's Satoyama socio-ecological production landscape was recognized as a site of global important agricultural heritage system by FAO in 2011. Shirakawa Gowan and Gokayama is protected as one of the nationally important preservation districts of a group of traditional buildings. And not a peninsula, however, only rice terrace of Shiro Yone Senmaida here is designated as a place of scenic beauty under the law for protection of cultural properties. Terraces is not anymore maintained by farmers, but maintained by volunteers experiencing the uh, rice harvesting participants recognizing the challenges to transcend the agriculture landscape for next generation. Second year in 2017, we visited the key mountains uh, in Western Japan under the theme of the sacred landscape. Sacred landscape is one of the oldest typology of nature culture linkages. Under the World Heritage Convention, a sacred landscape is recognized as a cultural heritage that is associated with belief. It can be a natural heritage, uh, which has superlative natural beauty and included in the natural parks in Asian context. Sacred sites and the pilgrimage route in key mountain range was inscribed on the World Heritage List in 2004 recognizing its outstanding universal value of a cultural landscape that represents unique fusion of Shintoism and Buddhism associated with the forest landscape. Starting from Koyasan, uh, participants traveled through Kumano Sanzan to Yoshino. Uh, participants realized how ancient belief of worship for nature, uh, Shintoism, merged with a more sophisticated Buddhism. Third year in 2018, we visited Hira Izumi and the Sandik Reconstruction Museum under the theme of the and the resilience. Participants visited uh, northern Japan affected by East uh, Japan Great Earthquake and Tsunami in 2011 and learned how heritage managers and the communities respond to the disaster and improve the resilience. Yaizumi, temple, gardens, and the archaeological sites uh, representing Buddhist Pure Land was inscribed on the World Heritage List just after the earthquake in 2011. Fortunately, uh, buildings of Chusonji and the Motsuji Temple was not heavily damaged by the earthquake. Participants moved to Minami Sanriku Town, a coastal area heavily affected by the tsunami and land how communities played an important role to improve the resilience to disasters. Uh, local fishermen decided to reduce the number of oyster farming left to improve the quality of oyster and the uh, environment of uh, uh, Shizugawa Bay. And there, they are aware that when the Shizugawa Bay was recognized as one of the Ramsar wetland in 2018, to help the restoration of coastal area, Ministry of Environment uh, declared the Sanriku Restoration National Park in 2015 and connected all the coastal area with 900 kilometer walking trail that can be used for tsunami evacuation route in case of emergency. Yeah, Professor, uh, two minutes. Yeah. Fourth year in 2019, we visit Mount Fuji under the theme of a mixed natural and her uh, cultural heritage. Mount Fuji was inscribed on the World Heritage List as a cultural heritage named Fujisan, Sacred Place and the Source of Artistic Inspiration in 2013. Uh, Mount Fuji is not a mixed heritage, but uh, half of its pro uh, properties are natural elements, such as volcano, lava tubes, waterfall, uh, spring water, lakes, and coastline. Uh, Mount Fuji and surrounding lakes are recognized as a place of scenic beauty uh, or natural monuments under the law for protection of cultural property. 
they are simultaneously a part of the Fuji Hakone is national park declared by the Ministry of Environment. Mm. Participants of the workshop visited both natural and cultural sites of Mount Fuji and learned management challenges from both natural and cultural administrations. This series of workshop was an experimental one that allowed uh, to explore four themes uh, relevant to the interconnections between natural and cultural heritage conservation, the Japanese experience and the participants case studies show the interconnectedness of nature and culture at site level. Separation of nature culture lies at uh, institutional and administrative level, but there are no divisions between nature culture at the ground level. Most important skills that heritage professionals need is an open-minded facilitation and respect for diversity. This need to be fostered by learning and understanding in the language diversity in Asian and Pacific region. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Masahiro. That's, that's a great sharing about the cultural landscapes. Actually, when cultural landscapes integrated into the World Heritage Convention in 1992, uh, it's actually linking the, the gap between natural heritage and cultural heritage. And I think um, just like you showed in the presentation, um, the new category also raised a lot of challenges waiting for our research and exploration in the information technology. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I think we will have a lot of questions on Mayor Board. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> our next speaker is from Australia is my great friend, uh, Susan Fenyard from the city of Ballarat. I think Susan is going to share her thoughts about and practices about historic urban landscapes. Please, Susan. Thanks, Chen. So hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. And I'd like to thank the Our World Heritage um, organizers for the invitation to present the case of Ballarat in Australia. See if this is going to work. I'll begin by introducing Ballarat, talk a little about UNESCO's historic urban landscape approach or the Hull approach, and then showcase some of the digital tools we've developed to engage local people and tell our city's story. Before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the many traditional owners of country, which includes the region I'll talk about today, and I pay my respects to all elders past, present and emerging. The city of Ballarat is a regional city located in the west of the state of Victoria in Australia. It has a population of over 109,000 people and services a region of over 400,000 people. Ballarat is situated on ancient country and the traditional owners of country are part of the oldest living civilization on earth. Ballarat's urban heritage, however, was established much more recently during the mid-19th century global, global gold rushes, and the city is renowned for its intact and authentic gold rush heritage, which forms part of the World Heritage Bid for the Australia's central Victorian gold fields. Since 2013, Ballarat city government has been a world leader in operationalising UNESCO's historic urban landscape approach, or what I'll call the Hull approach, as part of a global pilot program. The success of the Hull approach depends upon aligning social and economic development goals with the goals of conservation and leveraging heritage to help diversify and strengthen local economies. Using this model, social and economic development departs from and reinforces the city's distinctive identity and its heritage rather than being separate or in conflict. The Hull approach requires us to recognise that places are dynamic and not static, and that the elements that make heritage vulnerable are complex. To address this, we need to understand the city's diverse values, including and beyond its OUV, and manage change both in and beyond designated heritage area boundaries. The Hull approach provides six critical steps as a guide for its application and requires the development of new community engagement, planning and knowledge, regulatory and financial tools. Early in the application of the Hull approach in Ballarat, it was identified that the development of digital tools would be critical. There were many reasons for this. Digital tools had the capacity to help address many of the practical challenges we had identified for applying Hull. 
For example, they could be used to bring together dispersed information about the city. They could help ensure local community values, their stories, and also conservation principles were captured, shared, and built into practical decision-making tools. And they could ensure data captured was available and considered beyond individual projects and despite political and staffing changes. However, at the time, we also identified that useful digital tools like 3D mapping and GIS, for example, had limitations, particularly when it came to demonstrating the dynamic nature of the city and its intangible elements and values. So we established research partnerships with FedUni, Curtin University, and the UN Global Compact Cities Program to help develop and test tools over time and focused our early efforts on exploring various digital tools, capturing and sharing open data and engaging with local citizens. And I might just mention that I actually work at the local city government. So I'm talking from the government's perspective here. We began by developing two key platforms in conjunction with CERTI at FedUni. The first was Hull Ballarat, an online public collaborative engagement platform and the second is Visualising Ballarat, a public GIS tool to capture and share the DNA of the city. Hull Ballarat provided an exciting and interactive platform to start celebrating the city, its heritage and its stories. It also provided a central home for cultural projects, community groups and researchers and was supported by the city government. Importantly, content was driven by a community engagement campaign called Ballarat Imagine, which asked all of the local citizens of the city what they loved, imagined and wanted to retain about Ballarat as it grows and changes. The city's heritage was top of their list and local places, local communities and local stories were all highly valued. The C tab on the website showcases digital tools such as image sliders, 3D terrain maps using LIDAR, videos, GIS, photo maps, timelines, interpretation apps, knowledge bases, image galleries, and 3D panoramas, and also provides links to online databases and website to demonstrate the many different ways we can see Ballarat, its connections that remain and the changes that have occurred over time. For example, Cityscapes Through Time uses a very, very simple photo slider tool to highlight the changes that have occurred over time. These sliders are also used in heritage trails and the concept is applied in augmented reality applications. Coupled with financial tools such as heritage grants, these photo sliders have also proven a useful tool for encouraging reinstatement of lost historic features on heritage buildings. The show tab showcases it's several engagement tools where local citizens can share what they think matters in their neighbourhoods, share their stories and input into city development strategies. One of the tools that was developed is called Time Capsule Ballarat and it captures local social values where people can pin things and tell us what's important about them. While another Memory Atlas is a wiki and linked open data style website that is written by local people about their memories containing their photos and their individual stories. Another example is the Miners Rest Heritage Tour. Several of the local Miners Rest citizens wanted to produce a heritage trail and record the memories of a long time local person. The key to this project was using easy to use and easy to access free technology so that the community could continue to develop these digital tools themselves over time. Google My Maps displays details about each of the historic sites and Vimeo and YouTube capture stories about life in Miner's Rest. There's QR codes out in the, um, in the neighborhood displayed at various locations. The data captured through this interpretation project has also been integrated in the Miners Rest Development Plan, helping to identify sites that require either better heritage protection or sensitive development controls. The Discover tab on the website brings together several interpretation projects developed by the local government and the local community. These include audio tours, 3D virtual tours, GIS mapping, written tours and other mapping tools. For example, rediscovering the town hall vaults unlocks the contents of the Ballarat town hall storage rooms following calls from local citizens to have access to its historic collections. Many of the collection is fragile, so digital technology was used to provide access, including through 3D scans of the objects and digital storytelling. The 3D scans are also available on the open data platform Sketchfab and have been accessed thousands of times, with some even used in gaming. 
And 3D tours of Ballarat subterranean world help people explore places they may not normally be able to access, such as historic underground prison cells and the upper levels of the Ballarat Town Hall. Songways uses interactive GIS that shows change over time, imagery, video and audio clips and other digital tools to capture the living soundscape of Ballarat. The public can also contribute to the tool using the Time Capsule Ballarat program. There is also much, much more on the Hull Ballarat website, including the Hull Toolkit, and I encourage you to take a look. The Hull approach requires both a comprehensive understanding of the diverse layers of the city, both natural and cultural, and tangible and intangible, as, and also to have meaningful engagement with local citizens to identify what is of value with the goal of conserving and harnessing these values as part of the city's future development. It's for this region, reason sorry, that much of the data collected through interpretation and engagement projects is incorporated in various digital decision-making tools such as this one, Visualising Ballarat. This tool is primarily a publicly accessible GIS platform. However, it's the data that has been brought together from various sources and shared as open data that sets this tool apart. Yeah, two Layers, minutes, please. Thank you, Chen. Layers yep. include both tangible and intangible elements and tell the story of Ballarat's dynamic historic and cultural landscape using GIS, geo-referenced historic maps, visualisation, documentation and imagery. Data is available as open data and in the GIS mapping tool itself and is used by local citizens, community organisations, businesses, development consultants, city planners and government agencies to engage with the city's heritage and local values and consider it at early stages of their decision making. Technology changes and evolves over time, we all know this. And it doesn't matter if the tools we are using are 3D tech, linked open data, GIS, et cetera, et cetera. If we don't have the data, we can't use it in our engagement and interpretive tools, and also to help inform our decision-making. So today, Ballarat's data is available on several open data platforms and they're growing. And most recently, smart tech is helping capture real change in the city over time. As a result of the global pandemic, more digital technology is being utilised for running virtual events and delivering virtual experiences, so the availability of this data has become even more important. Digital tools have been an important part of helping build pride in the city's heritage and in applying the Hull approach, these tools have been shaped by what local people told us they wanted. They have told us that they have a very strong attachment to Ballarat its character, its stories, its history and its identity and that we need to do more to make sure this is shared and accessible. And we only know this because through Hull, we have to ask the questions. And I cannot encourage you enough to explore the Hull approach, the Hull tools being developed by several cities around the world and also its potential. And I congratulate our World Heritage on this very significant event. And thank you again for the opportunity to share our experiences with you today. Further information on our work is available through the details shown here, and I'll post them either in Miro or on Zoom. And um, thank you. Thanks, Chen. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan. Um, it's amazing. I have been following Ballarat's digital urban landscape practice for five years. Actually, every year they have new stuff on the website. So please go to their website and uh, I think you can easily spend, you know, a uh, half day or day to play with the, all the tools on it. It's amazing. Um, I think in my opinion, I think Ballarat's interpretation based on information technology, the most uh, important challenge and their um, achievement is to switching the interpreter and the stakeholder. Stakeholder becoming parts of the interpret uh, interpretation process uh, based on the application of information technologies. So I think um, the presentation and all the thoughts is raised a lot of you know, new ideas for us. Thank you very much, Susan. Okay, uh, Thanks, okay. I think we have already, uh, we have uh, many questions for the speakers on um, mirror board or chat box. So I will hand, uh, I finished my job now and I just passed uh, the host to my colleague Devai, who is going to chair the next part of this. Okay. Thank you for all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chen. And uh, I'll, uh, the Komal and Kanid were, uh, had, uh, were the reporters uh, for this session. So we would like to thank them and request Kanis to maybe share the key points or key questions that have emerged 
Uh, meanwhile, I, it is my also my job to summarize the discussion uh, during the uh, uh, during the um, uh, plenary speakers. We had had very interesting the three presentations, excellent presentation, which covered almost uh, several uh, challenges and issues that are faced by our world heritage. And um, like I think the several technologies uh, that were shown uh, can truly transform uh, the way our world heritage sites are either conserved, monitored, or experienced, some of which were uh, shown and demonstrated to be used on sites uh, by Dr. Dong, uh, Dr. Susan, and Dr. Mahito, Masahito. Uh, but there are several other ones also, which we are, maybe can be discussed further during the panel discussion. I'm sure you are aware of uh, gamification, which I think Susan mentioned a little bit. But then there is the artificial intelligence. Now we have mixed reality, the big data or cloud technology. And they're all started to be used uh, in some way or the other for both our cultural and uh, natural heritage. The, I mean, each of these technologies offer us uh, several possibilities of uh, high user engagement or customized content uh, controlled environment for distant monitoring, uh, even uh, highly interactive uh, distant uh, interpretation. And also very importantly, information accessibility, which is also uh, offers us pot potential for cross-referring several of the uh, best practices that had been developed in the three presentations on the three world heritage sites. One can learn from them and uh, uh, one can build upon them. Uh, now, of course, there are several tools but uh, with the tools, we also have several uh, challenges. Now, as our, uh, the theme of uh, this session is on the digital divide, uh, we are all aware that uh, there does exist a, div a digital divide. And I must say that it is not only physical or related to limited access to the technologies in which some of the countries um, may be facing or some of the communities or sites may be facing. But we also need to uh, intellectual and perceptional divide as is exists between technology and heritage. Um, this is also <clears throat> a <an> challenge. <coughs> Sorry. Um, plus, I think um, the learnings from nature and culture heritage uh, is also required, uh, as well as the involvement of uh, the communities, their engagement, how both uh, uh, Masahito and Dr. Susan were able to demonstrate in their examples. A very important point that was brought out, and this is also my personal experience, <clears throat> which is common, I think, largely in Asia also, that uh, the heritage in heritage goes much beyond world heritage. It combines all aspects of natural, cultural, and even intangible heritage. So we should look heritage in a more composite way, maybe not uh, put them into certain uh, categories and silos. Yes, maybe it is required for certain managemental or administrative purposes. But when we are dealing with them, I think they'll have to be looked at in a much more integrated, compact, and comprehensive ways. Uh, the other issues I think that perhaps uh, I would um, flag for the panel discussion, which is the session that is going to be going to be now uh, having after this, is that even when the new technologies have potential to make our world heritage size self-resilient, reliant, uh, and also make part of a larger network as I think Dr. Dong had pointed in his presentation. However, there are also several cautions. 
Now with technology, like with everything else, there must something, some of the price comes. And when I say price, it's not physical, but there are concerns and issues of authenticity and ethics. Some these principles are very dear in cultural as well as natural conservation. So these are things that needs to be reconciled, addressed, and uh, maybe even debated on how these will have a long-term impact on our World Heritage uh, uh, sites, uh, as I think uh, their uh, larger impact still uh, needs to be uh, established. And um, uh, lastly, you know, I mean, uh, I, I'm from India, so uh, I, I would like, I would, um, uh, I, I'm aware that in Indian mythology, uh, there is uh, a description of a particular era, which is basically called Ram Rajya. Now, this is an era where people were supposed to be living very happily as information and truth was all pervasive. And, you know, it, interestingly, today's technology offers us that possibility that we have access uh, through technology, that we can have multiple interpretation of the same truth. And uh, each person's truth could also have some meaning and same things can be looked at from different, different perspective. People can contribute to the same thing in a truly uh, maybe democratic and a transparent way. So with that, I uh, think that these issues would be now onwards discussed in our panel room, and the questions are uh, had been addressed to the to the various speakers, and we will pass it on to them, and uh, we can uh, we can request them if uh, if there would be a possibility to for them to answer either in the networking session or. Uh, directly uh, through the mirror board uh, later. So uh, thank you. And uh, now I think we will have a five uh, minutes uh, break in which we will be playing a video. And then thereafter, Hyson will brief you on the next um, uh, session, uh, next next program of the panel discussion. Over to you, Hyson. Are you curious about the links between technology and our world heritage? Você tem ideias inovadoras sobre como usar a tecnologia da informação para conservar e promover o seu bem? Em Iá, Penha, Mayan Sawananze. Em 24 horas, a Vish Sambar, Vigyan se hamare dunia ki darova, Karupantar, Pargoshti me hamare saati. Urinan Seke Hakte Samo in Yorobunduko Hamke, Yusan the Tachung Jong in Yagidre, Kakita or Nonoro Humiago, Yusan Tayan is of the way they saw Dunia Ujamida. Farahana Amal faced at La, Kaifayum Kili Hadi Takania, and to Jasira Benet to Rathat Tobia with the coffee, one to Hazar Wabuta Bainahuma. A discutir la manière dont les outils innovants les approches suivies peuvent être utilisées pour améliorer la conservation de nos héritages les plus précieux. Chou Fuku and Jana Shuki. Doe met ons mee voor samenwerking over de grenzen heen en intercultureel collectief denken. We welcome you to our online webinar, January 9th, 2021, during the session of your choice. Quieres compartir tus historias favoritas del patrimonio mundial? Bienvenido. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.